hello. <laughs> Welcome to Moments with the Master for this 25th day of January 2021. I am Father Josh White, the Egg Friar, uh, pastor at First <laughs> not that. Um, St. Martin's Celtic. Catholic. <laughs> flashback. That's been on my mind recently. Long story. Um, and I'm joined by my brother, Chris, who is um, here with me. He's at what we used to call the compound. And um, if he's a little laggy, it's because he is in um, slow. Place. Yes. So um, our readings for today are for the third Sunday of um, after Epiphany, and they are Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, Psalm 25, verses 3 through 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 through 31, and Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. As always, we encourage you to read all of those. Um, there's So I'm going to read the gospel and then I'm going to kind of take a, I don't know, detour, if you will. Um, now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And passing along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So, um, you know, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That's, uh, you know, we are should be very familiar, very, very familiar with that story I, I do like to point out, and this is one of the values of reading the Gospels together so that you get an idea of timeline. It's not like Jesus came out of the blue one day and he was a complete stranger. Um, James and John, no, John for certain, and definitely uh, Peter and Andrew, uh, although he's called Simon in this passage, um, but they had already known Jesus for quite a few weeks, maybe months at this point, um, had followed him for a little while, um, and then uh, definitely went back to fishing. So this was kind of Jesus' second call to them, if you will, which is interesting to me. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't jump in both feet the first moment um, they met Jesus, they hung out for a while, and then were drawn back into what they were more familiar with, and then chose to follow him full time after that. And, um, and so I just, I love that whole follow me. And I, I use that phrase, I rarely call myself a Christian now because that carries a lot of connotations, many of them negative. Um, and I will most, more often than not tell people that I am a follower of Christ or a follower of Jesus. Um, but, and I was just, as Chris and I were preparing to do this, I was just telling him, I've just got nothing. And then just something, you know, thank you, Holy Spirit, jumped out at me. So one of my uncles, uh, so I'm my dad, my father is the oldest of five brothers. One of my uncles has taken it upon himself. To, he created a Facebook group and has been posting um, old pictures and letters and things. And he posted a couple of things that like had me in tears earlier this week. Uh, one was from my great great from my great grandfather so my grandmother's father so his name was Waldo P Robertson he was a minister um, back in the early 1900s Presbyterian um, and <laughs> interestingly our our my my ministry journey and his have is interestingly been extremely similar huh. because he I've never thought about that. You're right. Took, yes, he um, took a hard stand against a direction that the the, uh, the Presbyterian Church as a whole, <clears throat> his church in particular, was taking, and um, 
and so basically was just cast out. He, you know, in his, the church he was in, the, uh, the, the people in charge kind of just turned their backs on him, um, abandoned him and threw him out. And uh, daddy, my father has said that, you know, in his growing up years, he remembered that my great grandfather, his grandfather really, um, only ever did supply work, uh, you know, filled the pulpit. But this is a letter, and I'm going to talk about my grandmother as well here in just a minute. But um, she also had a pretty amazing journey of faith. But let me, so my grandmother's name was Isabella. And so this is dated uh, March 28th, 1941, um, which is just, I mean, so what is that? 80 80 years ago, 80 years ago, Mm -hmm. two months. And, um, you know, prior to World War, prior to our entry into World War II, which is just, it boggles my mind to think about that kind of stuff. But he says, Dear Isabella, well, I took my fountain pen to Pearl Drug Store to be uh, sent in so they can um, find another or replace another ink sack in it. It has not returned yet. Well, the Lord is most gracious to us, for he is giving us another chance. I began as stated supply of a group of four churches in Fayetteville Presbytery. Next Sunday is my first Sunday at Poplar Tent, and the first Sunday in April, I began in the new field. One church... um, in, and I can't, his handwriting is pretty atrocious, in something in Carthage, North Carolina, he mentions a couple of cities, one out of Eagle Springs, one at Eagle Springs, and one out from West End. Their names are, and he names the churches, um, I can't, I, his handwriting, um, I get $125 per month. I hope that this time God and his kingdom shall be first. He writes it in all caps and underlines it first in our thoughts and life. As I see it, that has never, he underlined that, never been the case in our home. I do not see how God has borne with us so patiently. I saw Mr. Mann the other day and asked him where you will be this summer. He said he did not know yet. Um, maybe you will be sent to Fayetteville Presbytery. We are so glad you are doing so well in your work. That last letter is a gem. I agree with you and hope such will be um, something in our care. I dare not open up my heart to anyone, not even to mother. God knows all and I can tell all to him. He understands I know God has never been first in our home. Well, I must close this note. I hope the Spirit of God will set his, um, his way in our home, and God will be first in deed and in truth. Our hope is to hear from you soon. Lots of love, Dad. So that's my, uh, it's my great-grandfather. And, you know, it's funny because from what I know from I mean, he suffered. I don't know that God wasn't first. I, I know that was his perception, and maybe he saw his own, the fact that maybe he wasn't following in a way that he felt was necessary. But I want to read this other thing that was written by my grandmother. Can uh, I, yeah, go ahead. Can I interrupt you real quick? Yes. I, I'm trying to remember... Um, the stories that that mama told us about them and i seem to recall that it was her parents the uh waldo and and his wife that would get in horrendous fights about money right yes yes they did and uh, and i and i imagine that that's what he's talking about and it makes me think you know like him i can see him reading uh the the epistle verse let those who have wives live as, live as if they have but none. Uh, let those who have all these things live as though they have none. There's a reading that's going to be happening in, in an upcoming Sunday where Jesus says, the kingdom of God is among you or the kingdom of God is with you. Different translations, you know. Um, 
And it looks like he was really trying to do that and willing to lay everything on the line for that purpose. And she prudently, from a worldly perspective, was like, no, you can't just throw all our money at ministry or, or you know. Well, like I can apparently, and I'll saying, say this. Go ahead. I can imagine her saying, why did you have to make a ruckus about this and not have a steady job? Why right. did you have to? Right. Okay, go ahead. Well, and apparently he he did he he was a poor money handler, and of course this is at a time yeah. I mean, you're talking the early 30s and, That's and genetic. 40s, yeah, where um, where men were expected the to depression. be the men of the house, but he um, he lost money. He uh, he speculated sometimes, and I think it was you know, oh, this is going to be a sure thing. And oh my gosh, I hear my own voice in this a few times over the years. Marilyn and I, God bless her. She has been extremely patient, but it, it, I feel like I am a made over version of my great grandfather. But, um, but I have learned from those mistakes. Um, so we're in a much better place financially, but this is, so I want to read this, this other thing, but he did, he, he hurt himself in some ways and that may have been part of it. Um, this is my grandmother. I don't know. I'm trying to see if there's a date on this when she actually, um, like if it says, oh, what I do? like if it says when she wrote it, but um, it does not. I'm, I believe it may have been in the 80s, but um, it's called My Spiritual Journey. And I'm, I'm thinking that she may have written it for um, a walk to Emmaus, which she went to. I remember mm -hmm. roughly. I, think she did. I do want to say this before I read this. Growing up, my parents um, had a very troubled relationship with my grandmother because they saw her as being extremely liberal. And so that really colored my relationship with her um, because that's all I knew about her. We didn't spend a lot mm -hmm. of time with her, um, but I want to read this. And, um, and this, again, following... Um, she says, I am the daughter of a Presbyterian minister. My parents, of course, had a lot of influence in the direction of my life. They were my Sunday school teachers for most of my early life. I can remember arguing election with my dad in his study when I was eight or 10 years of age. We had a yes, second see her doing that too. Yeah. We had a tithe pitcher, and all of the family put their tithe into the pitcher. It was like the widow's jar of oil, it never ran out. Dad and mother had worship services for the chain gang. Mother played the little hand organ and dad preached and then visited with the men. This is one of my earliest memories and I had my own special prisoner. When I was six years old, we moved to a mill village. The church members were very poor and many were illiterate. For this reason, they taught the children of the congregation, all ages, dividing them into two classes. Each summer for many years, they attended the leadership education classes in Montreat, North Carolina, in order to provide the best teaching for children. As a teenager, I went with mother and dad to the county home on Sunday afternoons. Again, mom played the piano, dad preached, and I played the violin. After the service we visited, during the Depression, many strangers came to our home for food. Mother never turned any away, for she said, we may be entertaining angels unawares. As a result of their example, during my college years, I was a member of the chapel group. My part was visitation in the homes on Sunday afternoons in the slums of Atlanta. The utter hopelessness of the people led me and a very close friend to form a prayer group of two in order to pray together for the people we visited and came to love. This was my first prayer group. My grandmother had a great influence on my life. She taught me eight or 10 Psalms. She always accepted me as I was. I cannot remember a time when I felt rejected by her. She died when I was 11 years old. I put a rose in her hand. It was as cold and hard as rock. Suddenly I knew about death and knew grandma was gone. After the burial, I lay on her um, lounge by a west window and looked at the golden and white clouds. For the first time, I questioned if there was a heaven with gold streets and pearly gates. I was completely shattered, feeling that I could not face life without her. Suddenly she was there with me. I could not see her, but I knew she was more alive and closer to me than I'd ever experienced her before. I have never questioned life after death. 
When I was about 12 years old in rebellion against my father, I stopped reading my Bible and praying daily. However, I was accepted at Agnes Scott College at 16 years of age, and I knew I was not academically prepared. I had never been away from home before. I was very afraid I would flunk out or have to come home due to homesickness. So I started my Bible reading at Genesis and prayers. I read to Jacob in the Ladder of Angels, and I prayed, if you will go with me and help me to graduate and not let me get homesick, you will be my God, and I'll always tithe. No one except God heard this prayer, which I prayed early in the week and each day until Sunday. My ears pricked up when my dad started reading about Jacob and the ladder. I was stunned, awed, frightened, humbled when dad said that you cannot bargain with God. I knew God was speaking to me and not dad. I've never doubted that God hears prayer. And if we are sincerely seeking him for any reason, he won't let us take the wrong path. In 1940, I bought Glenn Clark's book, I Will Lift Up Mine Eyes. This book made a deep impression on my life. I have gone back to it time and time again in all the crises in my life, especially his chapter on the prayer of relinquishment has helped me in the most difficult times. When my four-year-old son was screaming in agony with polio, I gave him to the Lord. The pain in my heart and soul did not go away, but I know, knew I could trust in God's goodness to do what was right for Robbie, and I knew that we were not alone in our suffering. Clark's chapter on forgiveness stood me in good stead as I struggled to get along with my mother-in-law. In the early 70s during Lent, I decided to give God something rather than deny myself. I, for the first time, consistently and daily gave him 10 minutes of my time. For too long, I was getting up at five in the morning to spend an hour with him before my day at school. She was a school teacher um, in during during the um, during the civil rights era. Um, she was actually somebody who very much stood up for uh, the rights of minorities. One blessing of retirement is that I do not need to stop with one hour in 1978. So now we're getting into a period of time where I was alive. I read about the Covenant Prayer Group sponsored by the Upper Room. Three of us formed a group and studied Maxie Dunham's workbook on prayer. For the first time, each of us were completely open and vulnerable to someone else. We all grew spiritually. In the spring of 1980, seven of us from our church attended a retreat at Carrollwood near Lenore, North Carolina. It was led by Don McLennan. Two of us heard of Church of the Savior and chose this retreat because Don was leading it. We'd never heard of a silent retreat. And I remember her talking about this. Um, Don was a real blessing as he led us through that weekend. I've attended 20 retreats at Carrollwood and each one has contributed so much to my journey. The silence, the introduction to contemplative prayer, the support of love from the members of the retreat and the members of the mission group, the many authors and books to which I've been introduced have enriched my life 70 fold. Judith and Conrad are just as great blessings as Don. I went home from Don's retreat and journaled with Elizabeth O'Connor's Your Many Selves for one year. There for the first time, I really faced myself, the beast and the angel. And boy, that is a description of her. Another book that <laughs> I respect is Kelsey's book on silence. This, his retelling of the story of the prodigal son is a wonderful experience every time I read it. Because of these books, I was able to dig up a lot of memories and forgive and understand many things against my parents, which I had repressed and forgotten for years. I first, I first heard of Church of the Savior when the manager of the Presbyterian Bookstore in Charlotte told me about O'Connor's call to commitment. Through the years, I have hoped that someday I would be able to visit the church. At present, I teach Sunday school classes, Circle Bible Study. I am on the board of the Women's Society as a representative of the youth. I also serve on the board of Christian Education and sing in the choir. And that's the end. Um, and so my grandmother was a follower. Um, I... I, I want to add something real quick. She yeah. she also talked about um, going with her dad, like a canon for whom several city, a, a city and a bunch of hospitals and things around here, name libraries, Kannapolis was the mill owner. And he, um, when, when they tried to unionize and ask for higher wages, he was just going to kick them all out of their homes and out of their jobs. And uh, her dad, Waldo went and pled for them uh, pled for their lives and for their jobs and for him to not do it. And, and he listened to him, mm -hmm. um, but she's been, it, it informed, I'd, I'd never heard about those other stories until I saw that those experiences informed her life and, uh, and, and her, um, fierce, uh, desire to help those who needed help. 
I, did, um, I didn't, I didn't know. Up, yeah. yeah, I didn't know about the prison thing, which is just fascinating to yeah. me. Yeah, I know <laughs> that this is a ministry that that I do now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't go minister to chain gangs, but in a sense, um, we're doing this, and um, and I just think about that legacy of following you know that even in i mean she didn't she she believed some things that i disagreed with she's very much a product of the the denomination and time frame in which she grew up and i understand that um but even though we may not, you know, if I were to sit down and talk with her today, well, she's in heaven now. So she knows that everything I believe is correct now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but even though, even if I could go back in time and sit down with her in the late eighties and, and, or, you know, talk to her, I think we would have more in common than, than what separated us and um, so that I, I don't, for what it's worth, I mean, that's, that's all I got. It's, you know, I, I think what we have forgotten is maybe in our culture, to, especially today, is we are so focused on trying to maintain a, a particular form of Christianity um, a particular connection to a way that the church interacts with our American government that we've just forgotten to follow and forgotten the um, humility that um, it belonged to those who suffered so much um, all those years ago. I don't know. Do you got anything you want to add? I do, uh, and I wish I had it with me so I could read the exact thing, but there, I, I, I was looking through some of my prison stuff, and one of them um, was just some quotes that I had found. I think that, the, that there, there was an Orthodox uh, priest that sent out a newsletter. Um, anyway, the story was from Abba John the Dwarf, and it told about how he had prayed to God to take away his um, struggles and to bring him peace. And God had answered his prayer, and he was telling um, uh, another uh, Ava about that, and uh, aesthetic father. And he said, "Oh, go right now and pray to God to to yep. give you a struggle, to give you an enemy, um, uh, because it is that is what we need to um, to become the people that uh, God is calling us to be." That if that if we're living in peace, then um, we're not we're not growing. Um, so, I mean, we know living our story. It's interesting to see how it goes all the way back through grandmother and great grandfather and and great grandmother too, um, and God making us through those struggles. But you can see the heart that comes out of it. Yes. Um, she did have, it, it reminds me of Katie as much as anybody I know, I, I, the, the Delicat Munster, a huge heart, and also will stab you in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as she, you know, she helped start churches um, in her mm -hmm. college years, and, and then... She was I, devoted I, to God for her whole life. Yep. Yes, and I know that during her, she didn't get, I, I have a feeling she would have been more than happy to remain single her whole life. And um, yeah, my grandfather was 12 years older than she was and basically just begged her to marry him. And mm -hmm. so she did. Um, thank, and I'm thankful because, and yeah, you're, you're here, but... Yep. Um, you know, it, she, she was something and then that's, but that's the thing we follow and then we call others to follow. And I tell people all the time, one of the best ways to, um, to expand the kingdom of God is to raise godly children. And I am thankful that, um, 
we have that legacy ongoing. Anyway, thank you, Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.